Christopher Pine, good morning. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning, Barry. Good to be with you again. Are you open to the idea of extending the sittings of the Parliament so that you can deal with the findings of the Royal Commission into the banks? No, we won't be doing that, Barry, and we won't be doing it for a very simple reason. Uh, to change the uh, laws around financial services and uh, respond to the Banking Royal Commission in the way that we wish to, we'll take about 40 different pieces of legislation. So trying to, uh, to do that in a rushed job uh, to fulfil a uh, political stunt that the Labor Party is trying to pull is no way to govern. And what we've tried to do in the last five years, of course, is to be sensible and methodical about the way we govern, and that's what we've done. So, no, we won't be calling the Parliament back uh, for another two weeks of feverish, rushed lawmaking for something that's far too important uh, for political stunts. But why is, it, why is it putting before the Parliament? Why is that rushing it? Because it will take time to draft those 40 pieces of legislation and to get them right. And so many times over the years we've seen legislation introduced into the Parliament uh, to, to try and fulfil an uh, unnecessary schedule uh, delay uh, you know, requirement that's apparently been set by someone and then only a few months later having to come back to fix that legislation because we got it wrong. So we're not prepared to do that. We want this to be a proper response. We've said that we will take action on all 76 of the recommendations of the Royal Commission. Uh, we will tread carefully on mortgage brokers because we don't want to smash competition in the banking sector. Ironically, Labor is taking the size, side of the big banks uh, by removing competition of the 16,000 mortgage brokers. We won't be doing that. We'll be treading more carefully. And this is exactly why we won't be rushing legislation into the Parliament for a feverish two-week sitting just to please Bill Shorten on the Labor Party. So there won't be any response in the Parliament for at least six months, maybe August, September? Uh, quite possibly. It'll be after the election, yes. And what do you say to the customers who... who you, they saw the government reject this 26 times and now that you've, you've got the recommendations in front of them, no action for seven or eight months? Well, we are taking action, and uh, uh, that's exactly what we've done. We've said that uh, we will go back 10 years and allow consumers to, uh, to go through AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, uh, to give them the support that they need uh, to be co compensated for bad treatment by the banks. Uh, we've given the federal court more power to act uh, against uh, those who've done the wrong thing in the banking sector. That will all happen. And we've also done a great deal already in the last few years, much more than the last Labor Party ever did when Bill Shorten was the Minister for Financial Services in the previous government. And there's legislation sitting in the Senate right now that the Labor Party could vote for to reform superannuation, to support consumers and introduce regulations that will protect the sector. And yet Labor's not voting for that because they're conflicted by their union-dominated industry super funds. On the Medivac uh, bill, um, it does seem as if the government has all but conceded defeat. The Prime Minister said that if Labor supports it, then it is likely to pass. Are you setting yourself for that, for a loss on the floor of the Parliament? Well, Barry, the Labor Party lost 64 votes on the floor of the Parliament in the 43rd Parliament, which was the last time there was a minority government. 64 votes. It really is not the biggest deal in the world that, the, that some people in the media are making it out to be. And if Bill Shorten wants to turn the green light on for people smugglers, wants to roll out the welcome mat for the people smuggling trade yet again, like they did last time they were in government, well, that will be on his head. And if any boat arrives, between now and Election Day, we'll be able to say that's here because of Shorten's law. If Bill Shorten wants to pass this legislation, Shorten's law will weaken border protection in Australia. There'll be more uh, people smuggling boats arriving. We'll have to reopen Christmas Island. That'll cost $1.4 billion to do so. It's back to those hideous days when there were 50,000 unauthorised arrivals on 800 boats and at least 1,200 deaths at sea. That's Labor's policy and they want to re-implement it. And if they vote that way this week, that'll be the second time they've tried to dismantle our border protection laws. The first, of course, being the abolition of temporary protection bases. All right, but let's have a look at some of what, what you've just said. If this bill passes, and you've said that it would, uh, it would virtually open the floodgates, the Minister yesterday said that it would mean substantially all of 1,000 people on Manus and Nauru will come to Australia. How is that? Why would almost all of them come to Australia simply because of ill health? 
Well, because two doctors in Australia would be uh, maybe Bob Brown and uh, Richard Di Natale could sign a, a, a certificate saying that they think that they're suffering from uh, mental health issues and they need to come to Australia. But you know so, that's not true. You know that's not true. It's the two doctors do not determine this. They can put the name up, but then the minister can reject that. Then it, well, then it goes to a full advisory panel appointed, by the way, by the government, by Border Force. And then it goes right through the appeal process back into the Administrative Appeal Tribunal, the Federal Court. This is exactly the model Labor set up last time they were in power, and that's why we were spending millions and millions but, of dollars <laughs> paying people's legal fees to take the government on to appeal the minister's decisions. But you're saying then that, that almost all of the, the thousand people involved would end up in Australia because this advisory panel appointed by the government would define that they're all ill. What they'll find uh, is that they'll be able to appeal the Minister's use of his discretion. Labor knows that. They'll all be caught up in the court system. They'll be coming to Australia one way or the other saying that they have uh, a need to because of ill health. Uh, and quite frankly, there are now most... There's nobody in Manus Island. Manus Island doesn't actually operate anymore as a detention centre. It's being closed down. Those people are in the community. There's nobody in <laughs> detention on Nauru. They are all part of the community. And there are no children left on Nauru. And the last few have got a process to come to Australia. Yeah, that, that's four. not relevant to what we're talking about at the moment. How is it that almost all of them would, would, uh, would qualify to be in Australia on the grounds of ill health? Well, they could all qualify. And the bottom well, line so is, So they're Barry, all ill. You're suggesting that they're almost all of them are ill. The bottom line is, Barry, we're not prepared to weaken border protection No, no, like that's not the is. point. Can you explain to me point. how it is that it's got to the point where almost all of them are ill? The point is, Barry, because of this government's policies, we've stopped the boats. Because well, of that's, temporary that's protection not an answer, visas, that's because not an answer of to that question. offshore You're... processing, because of boat turnbacks, we've had this debate before, and there's always people that want to weaken border protection. Now, it's not easy being tough on board. It's not easy for governments to have to make these tough decisions. And that's why you need a coalition government doing it, because if Labor's in power, every time they're in power, they're too weak to stop the boats coming to All Australia. Right, this would come down in the end to an advisory panel appointed by Border Force's Chief Medical Officer. Are you saying they would game the system to the extent where they would allow a thousand people to qualify on medical grounds? We're saying that the system that we've put in place has worked. It has worked. And that the vast majority of children that, that are now That is totally out of irrelevant to, to, what, to what this bill now says. Well, I'm not prepared to sit here and go through line by line through the bill, but I'll tell you what this... I'll tell you this much. The advice from security agencies, which we've declassified, is very clear. The advice from security agencies is this will weaken our border protection laws. It'll lead to more people coming to Australia. We'll have to reopen Christmas Island at a cost of $1.4 billion to take into account the number of people that will be brought to Australia and we will lose control yeah. of offshore processing. That's what happened last time under right. Labor and we're not prepared to let it happen again. You talk about that security advice. Um... Uh, Peter Dutton said that it, uh, basically the, the security agency said that if this bill was to pass, that would be a disaster. Mm -hmm. Was that your reading of it as well? It would be a disaster? That's what the security agency said? Well, I think he was, he was making the point that the, the advice from the security agencies is that it would reopen... No, no, he uh, said the, it would be a disaster. ..people smuggling, and he said it would be a disaster, and he's quite right, it would be. How, how, how was this classified information leaked in the first place. As Defence Minister, does that concern you? Well, leaks always concern me, Barry, no doubt about it. Uh, but I don't know how it uh, got into the hands of the Australian. I just have the faintest clue. Well, and that's the... why the AFP uh, will, are investigating it. The, the only people at the meeting, of course, were the security agencies and government ministers. It's a fairly narrow field. Well, as I said, the AFP, it was actually quite a large number of people, it's about 30 people, sit on the NSC, uh, either as members of uh, agencies, departments or the government itself, and the AFP has been asked to investigate where that might have come from, and we've now declassified it uh, to take the mystery out of it. Yeah, and that's interesting. How does that happen? Who classifies it in the first place, and then who can declassify well, the minister responsible, I think, it was the person who cl can either classify or declassify on the advice from his department it's or really her department. Loose arrangement. You have this classified stuff and it's leaked, and then you can just suddenly declassify. Well, I think the, the, the assessment was made, Barry, that it would be better for everyone to see what the advice was rather than to be second guessing it.
All right, just uh, one other issue uh, before we go on climate change. Um, Tony Abbott said yesterday the government has a satisfactory climate change policy going into the next election. That's not what Julie Bishop recently said in a speech in Hong Kong. Where do you stand on this? Do you think that you need more substance around climate change between now and the election? Well, we need to keep going with our three-pronged strategy, and that is uh, essentially uh, trying to bring prices down for consumers uh, for their energy bills, which we've done, uh, ensuring that we are reducing uh, our emissions uh, into the atmosphere in order to fulfil our international obligations, for which we are entirely committed, uh, and making sure that uh, uh, the energy supply is secure. Now, we are doing all those things through Snowy Hydro 2, uh, through having an agnostic uh, all of the above approach to uh, all kinds of energy uh, transmission and the prices are coming down that's a fact there are some in the party though surely you'd concede that would like to see more substance put on the climate change policy between now and the election I think we have a very, very substantial policy, as I've just outlined, and we've done a lot in the area of climate change in the last five years, and that's why we'll meet our international targets, our Paris targets, Kyoto, of course. Uh, we are getting on with the job and we're getting the outcomes. Now, we're not getting into the weeds of uh, some of the hysteria in the debate, but we are making sure that we are doing the policies that we promised to do and they're having the outcome that they, int that they intended. It, we're fulfilling well, our international obligations, bringing down prices, and and securing the energy supply. Is Julie Bishop getting into the weeds of hysteria when she says that she would like to see bipartisan support with Labor on energy policy? I don't think she's sounding in the least bit hysterical. She's been so part of the government. So that's a good idea? It would be a good idea to, to reach out and have bipartisan support with Labor? She's energy. been part of the government for the last five years. It's implemented exactly the policies that I've just outlined. Look, Labor's not interested in bipartisanship, Barry. Uh, Bill Shorten's always writing letters saying he wants to be bipartisan, and then within 12 to 24 hours, he's demanding uh, that the government change its policy entirely and refusing to, to cooperate. So he's just inside the Canberra bubble, wanting to fight on every issue. We know that, uh, and the public know it too. That's why he's so miserably unpopular, because he's just a politician in the Canberra bubble, where Scott Morrison is seen to be because he is someone who wants to make the country better. Thanks for your time this morning. It's always a pleasure.